Like many, especially you guys watching this video, the MCU has spanned most of our young adult lives. I myself was 9 years old when the first Iron Man came out, and I've been an avid fan of the MCU ever since. Some are worse than others, and yes the movies are becoming monotonous and very samey, but with the fresh takes from Taika Waititi and new characters being introduced to this universe, it's ever present that the MCU still has quite a future to come. Speaking of that future, we have Captain Marvel. Quite obviously, Marvel is looking to make Carol Danvers a main player in the MCU, one of the new Trinity, one of the characters that will have lasting effects on the MCU. So today what I wanted to talk about is Captain Marvel, more specifically the sequel in production and why that sequel is so important, being the make it or break it moment for the character and the MCU as a whole. So let's dive into it. So to make this simple, what I want to do here is give you a refresher on my opinion of the first movie and by extension the general consensus on the movie overall, where they went wrong with Carol's character, how she can be redeemed, and the story that we can tell to get her to that place of redemption. Safe to say her first solo outing was divisive. You have the people who love the movie and just don't have a problem with it, and hey, that's fine. You do you. You also have the people who realise the movie's just meh, but love Brie Larson, so they'll defend it regardless. The last camp are the ones who just don't care for the movie, that think it's not too crash hot. Is that like a personal attack or something? Or you... Now, I sort of fall into the third camp, the ones that just don't care for the movie. To me, it's on par with Thor The Dark World or Ant-Man and the Wasp, and no, it's not because I'm some sexist misogynist that doesn't like the movie. It's because it just fails as a movie to be compelling. Let's just keep this quick. The pace of the movie is all over the place. The first half an hour feels good because essentially it's one long action scene. Then when the action stops, we enter the longest second act you've ever experienced, all before the third act that has zero stakes and payoff to an arc that wasn't set up in the first place. I have nothing to prove to you. The movie never attempts to develop the supporting characters. Listen up team, knock it off. Being the Star Force or the Kree homeworld of Hala. So when Carol turns on the Kree, we don't really care. Now that's due to the writing of Carol and the flow of the plot. I was also surprised with the lack of nuance the movie has. It had the chance to say a lot of things about gender in a really subtle way. To be the subtext to the film. Sort of like Wonder Woman. But it's political commentary and bluntness is so in your face it takes away from any finesse the movie could have had otherwise. It's almost cartoonish in the way it depicts misogynism misogynistic men, or strong women for that matter, as if you need to be a dick to be strong. The movie even struggles at its base function of just being an action movie, with previous superhero movies outclassing Captain Marvel at every try. The train fight? Well, it's been done better in The Wolverine, a fight scene with cool music overlaid, that's also been done better in Thor Ragnarok. My central issue with the movie is the main character, Carol Danvers. Comics aside, looking at this character in this movie, we have an abundance of issues. Carol is presented as sarcastically flat, lacking the natural charisma of other Marvel heroes like Iron Man or even Hawkeye. And hey, not everyone has to be witty and charming, but if they're going for that swagger, at least make it not sound condescending. Congratulations, Agent Fury, you have finally asked a relevant question. The emphasis here is showing that she's strong, that she's a powerful woman, but because of that, they don't let her be vulnerable or weak for a second. They don't take the time to make her human. She never learns the lesson of humility. She starts cocky and ends cocky. It's not like Marvel hasn't told this story before. Take Thor for instance, a powerful god that is essentially the same character on the same journey. They're both blonde, both jump into battle, both love to punch through ships. The key distinction here is Thor in his movie learns humility. He learns to humble himself in his power, to be worthy of it. Carol learns what exactly? To be stronger than she was before? Carol's shown to be trigger happy as a result of being with a Kree for the last six years, firing on a whim, using force to demonstrate strength, but we skip straight past any chance to develop Hulla or the Kree or the propaganda machine that has made her that way. Wanna fight? Because of this lack of development at the start of the film, her aggression looks as if it's a part of her character and not a result of the Kree making her that way. Carol's shown to be mean-spirited, kicking, or in this case dragging, a man while he's down. Ugh. All I'm saying is, they had a chance to show that the Kree did a number on her, making her this aggressive heroine. To me, it's just a wasted opportunity. Fans have expressed an issue that she's overpowered, that she's facing an adversary that she walks, or in this case, flies through with ease, destroying any dramatic tension in the third act. I myself have no problem with her being overpowered. I don't think that's the issue. If anything, the last 80 years of Superman stories has taught us that we can tell stories about overpowered gods, as long as we make the stories interesting through giving them obstacles that challenge their powers, making the threat intellectual, something they can't just punch through. Now the last thing I want to do is talk about her likability as a character. I know it's a real thing about telling women to smile, just 
don't do it, it's super misogynistic to do, but when talking about the lead of a film, when trying to create a compelling character, having our heroes smile is a nice way for us to connect to them very quickly. To me that's the difference between Christopher Reeve and Henry Cavill's Superman. No matter how serious the stakes are in Marvel's movies, finding time for our heroes to genuinely smile does subconsciously make them more endearing. And in Captain Marvel, the self-seriousness through and through made her appear quite bitter. Even if we look at Endgame, the bits of smiling Carol gets to do here just makes her a whole lot more likeable. Something I like about the movie, or should I say the idea of the movie, is that Carol Danvers is a role model for young women, and I think young women need to have strong role models in movies to look up to. I think it's great that we're getting this representation, but the character's intentions will always trump representation. If the character isn't a positive influence, it defeats the purpose of being a role model. If Carol is trigger happy, aggressive, mean spirited, cocky, and learns nothing, that doesn't do much for young women. It's nothing to aspire to. On the other hand, we have some great examples of female heroes that are positive influences. Role models that are kind, yet decisive, loving, yet powerful. Heroes like Wonder Woman or Daenerys. Let's not talk about the last two seasons. What I'm trying to get at is that there is a swath of strong women in film, from the badass Furiosa to the strong-headed Leia, the daring survivalist Ripley to the sharp and precise assassin Gamora. Now, all this being said, what I want to do is look at how we can fix this character going into Captain Marvel 2. Take all the problems I've listed, her fire first attitude, her cockiness, and spin it into something interesting that allows the character to learn. I personally think the villain of the sequel shouldn't be someone with the exact same power set as Carol just bad. Carol fighting another copycat, like every other Marvel movie, isn't going to be all that interesting. We've seen it being done time and time again. What I'd like to do with Captain Marvel 2 is give Carol an adversary she can't necessarily hit. She can't fight her adversary if she doesn't know who they are. It's the Scrubs. I'm talking about the Scrubs. Now, I know what you're thinking, but Mitch, in the MCU, they're the good guys. Well, I'd like to point out that cultures are complex. There are good and bad people on both sides. It's entirely possible the refugee Scrolls we've seen are a peaceful faction of a much larger galaxy-conquering race, with warships and a queen and all that sort of jazz. But to stick to the movie. In the sequel, I'd have the Scrolls use their shape-shifting to their advantage to create some scenes that are a little more interesting than just tricking the person next to you. Okay, imagine this. Perhaps Carol is chasing a scroll through a crowd, and she's struggling to keep a hold of the scroll. Perhaps the scrolls trick her, playing on her aggressiveness as they get her to take out something that only assists their goals. Doing this, having the scrolls trick Captain Marvel in a Zemo-esque fashion, sets up a character arc for Carol, that she can't be this fire first and talk second kind of hero, that she needs to humble herself and her powers, to be worthy of them. She needs to start thinking and be less of an aggressive hero, as that aggression gets her nowhere but destroying everything around her. Hopefully you can see what we're doing here, where you using the flaws of the character in the first movie and we're building a character arc upon them. What I'm trying to get at is that I want Carol to be smarter with her powers. I'd like if she smiled a bit more. Like I said before, heroes that smile subconsciously are a lot more endearing, so having her win over the audience first is a must. I personally don't think we need to depower Carol. I think embracing your strength is a great message, especially for young women. To stay on point, the movie's scope can be huge, but the drama needs to be intimate personal. Having Carol face an Amada, well that gets boring. Having Carol protect what's important to her, the Avengers, Rhodey, well that's a lot more interesting. Having the stakes of the movie come from her friends being in danger is a lot more engaging, and additionally it allows us to see what's most important to Carol, her friends and family. I don't want to see her get nerfed. Keep the overpowered elements to her character, after all it is a lot of fun to see Captain Marvel do her thing, but have her learn to control her powers, learn humility the same way that Thor did. This way we can keep the Captain Marvel is a role model for young women message, but this time that role model is someone we can be proud to say is a good, dare I say a great, hero. Like I said before, having Carol protect her interests, what's important to her, is a great way to tell a story about an indestructible hero. After all, if we can't hurt her, we can still hurt what's important to her. Now what I'm proposing is to play Play on her interests, to further complicate the story, to make what she cares about a conflict of interest, have Rhodey be a scroll. If we were to do a sequel to Captain Marvel, there's no doubt it will be Secret Invasion. To me it's the obvious choice to take the character and the scrolls in the MCU. For those wondering what it may look like, I made a little teaser concept so feel free to check it out. So what we've done here so far is summarise the issues with Captain Marvel in her first movie, we've been able to discuss ideas on how to better her character moving forward, and now I want to apply those ideas in a brief mock-up of what a Captain Marvel 2 could look like. So stick your fan fiction caps on 
and let's get into it. So what I want to do here is have the scrolls infiltrate Earth. Their goal is to destroy a sword base that's shielding the scroll armada from entering Earth space. Sort of like how Endor was protecting the Death Star. Throughout Act 1, Captain Marvel is on the hunt for Skrull agents, unaware that they are covertly setting up this bombing. She's brash and firing at every chance that she gets at the scrolls. At the end of Act 1, Carol fires and misses the scroll, instead hitting a fuel cell which causes an explosion. Monica Rambeau, the head of Sword's Earth forces and commander at that base, who's also in the chase, gets caught in the explosion that Captain Marvel causes due to her aggressive brashness. Carol only just saving her by cocooning her from the explosion. Doing this makes Carol responsible for the explosion, and her friend's coma for that matter. At this point, Carol is realising that she needs to change her ways. Essentially, the idea here is to take what Carol cares most about, her friends, and in this case, Rhodey, and play on that. At the midpoint of the movie, Rhodey can reveal to us that he is a scroll. He turns and faces Carol. His leg braces come off, and he morphs into a scroll right in front of her. She's filled with all these emotions, especially after just hurting her friend. Confusion, disappointment, anger, sadness, rage. She gets in his face, grabbing him by the neck. He says, what are you going to do, Carol? Hit me? Kill me? He transforms back into Rhodey and says to her, go on. Use your fists to solve your problems, like you do everything else. Carol clenches Rhodey's throat tighter, wanting to crush him, but she drops him and she says no. Now, Carol deciding not to kill Skrull Rhodey is a turning point for the character in the movie. She learns that she can't just punch her way through everything. Now, I get a lot of people will be disappointed if Rhodey turns out to be a Skrull. After all, he's one of my favourite heroes in the MCU. If you really wanted, you could have the real Rhodey lead an escape mission on a Skrull ship, like the B-plot of the movie. Sort of like how Captain America did with a few Marvel characters in that one Avengers episode. We have Skrulls in every organisation on Earth. I only tell you this because the invasion you spoke of it is already over. Perhaps instead of escaping, Brody sacrifices himself blowing up the ship, allowing the other agents to narrowly escape. That way he can at least go out like a hero in the MCU. It'll also be a fitting end to conclude Don Cheadle's time in the MCU as Rhodey, as he'll be approaching 60 by the time they get around to making a secret invasion movie. And considering his age, they'll be needing to look for an exit for his character sometime soon. And what better way than sacrificing himself, literally becoming a war machine. And so the third act of the movie begins. What I want to do here is sort of replicate the end of Return of the Jedi. Han and Leia disabling the defences to the Death Star on Endor. Lando in a space battle responsible for blowing up the Death Star. And Luke with the Emperor and Vader, the most important part of the movie. See here we have Falcon leading some of the less OP Avengers as they fix the base's shielding system, allowing Earth to be protected from incursion. As Skrull imposters attack, they must defend the sword base. Now doing this will keep these heroes there for a remainder of the movie. In space, the rest of the Avengers and a few sword agents decide to take the fight to a Skrull Armada that has just appeared out of hyperspace in Earth's orbit. A space battle ensues whilst Carol takes her fight to the Sword Command Deck, facing off against Maria Hill, who's revealed herself to be Varank. So we have a few things going on. One, we have the Avengers busy, and that's important as it needs to be Carol who defeats Varank. So the Avengers are busy defending a base or battling an Armada. The Captain Marvel, however, is with Varank as she enters the Command Deck in a sort of Mexican standoff kind of way. Defeated sword agents surround the two, kill or injured and barely moving. Vronk tells Carol her motives in that evil plan sort of way, why she wants Earth, telling her that Earth is in a perfect spot that'll place them to attack and cripple the Kree Empire. She then raises her hand, holding a remote detonator. Vronk says that if she cannot have Earth, then she'll drop the peak straight out of orbit, sending the space station plummeting down to devastate the planet. Now, Carol is in an interesting spot, a dilemma of sorts. She doesn't like the Kree, but she doesn't like this evil faction of the Skrulls either. But she can't blast Varank. If she does that, she's risking the possibility of Varank pressing the trigger, which will send the peak plummeting. At this point, Carol has learned that she has to talk to her, to reason with her. She can't be the aggressive, fire first woman she was before. So Carol talks to her, saying that violence isn't everything, that it doesn't need to be like this. Varank is getting more and more worked up, mirroring where Carol used to be. This aggressive woman trumped up on her own power. All of a sudden, however, Varank stops talking. In shock, she feels her belly to see green blood. She's been shot from behind by Abigail Brand, who's managed to regain consciousness. Vronk drops to the ground and drops the controller. Carol flies over to her and appears that all is well. However, the controller starts beeping. An emergency failsafe is deployed, and the station starts falling towards Earth. Carol races to the south side of the station, pushing from the bottom. Both Thors in space see this and begin to help her. We see that Carol doesn't need to do things alone. Doctor Strange starts doing some magic, slowing down the peak, but it isn't stopping. At the peak command deck, Brand is able to get to the control station and engage the boosters. The heroes are pushing, but they're sort of in the same spot, all before it starts to move. Carol opens her eyes, and Monica Rambo is there, pushing the station back into orbit. So the Skrull Armada is defeated, their leader Vronk is dead, the base successfully stayed operational, which left them with no 
other choice but to flee. In the aftermath, the epilogue of the movie, Carol can be like, Monica, you're flying. You have powers. And she can be like, yeah, I think you shielding me from the blast did something to my DNA. So, we've successfully been able to tell a Captain Marvel sequel. That sort of works the same way that Civil War did. As that was an Avengers 2.5, this is sort of an Avengers 4.5 before we eventually get our new Avengers movie sometime into Phase 5 or 6. We've managed to utilise S.W.O.R.D. in an interesting way, and above all else, reinvent Carol Danvers' character into a compelling hero with flaws, wants, desires, and an interesting threat that forces her to grow as a character. Now, if there were to be a third movie, I would totally have that take place after the first MCU X-Men movie in Phase 6. So in X-Men, Carol gets sucked dry of her powers by Rogue. So when we go into Carol's third movie, she's just not as powerful as she used to be. And considering the villain of the third movie will probably be the returning Kree forces of yon Rogue and the Supreme Intelligence, well, she'll be needing all the strength she can get. Regardless, that's my pitch for Captain Marvel, how we can reinvent her character into a compelling hero for Secret Invasion. With that all being said, I want to know what you guys thought of the video, how my Captain Captain Marvel 2 turned out. Leave me your thoughts below and I'll see you guys in the next video. Ciao.